So Sandeep, the recording has been started. You can go ahead with the session. Yep, thank you. So hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to another session. Uh, so today we'll be covering databases. Once again, this will just be an overview session. So we are not going very much in depth. Okay, so to get started, so what we'll be covering, so we'll be covering the differences mainly between data, information, and technology. We'll define the term database. We'll see what is the role of a database management system. Describe the characteristics of a warehouse, then data mining, and its role in an organization. So when we speak about data, what is actual data is just raw bits and pieces of information. Mainly it would be quantitative, that is numeric figures, qualitative, it will be descriptive. Alone, without the numeric or without the description, your data would not be very useful. So you would generally relate it with each other. Information is when data is given context and is more specific. Knowledge is further developed when information has been aggregated and analyzed to make decisions, set policies, and spark innovation. Now, wisdom finally comes when it's a combination of knowledge and experience. So this is not something that is immediately visible. So this does take years to develop. It's not just the data that you collect. So you also need to derive knowledge from that. And with your experience, then you can also see how to take that forward. So what are databases? Databases are organized collection of related information to generate knowledge for decision-making purposes. Now you'll get many definitions for databases on the internet so those are also correct so this is not the hard and fast rule so databases are used for many purposes so depending upon the purpose that you use it for your database definition may change a bit but mainly it's just for organizing your related information so that is the main purpose that you would use your database for and yes, from that collected data, you would generate reports that you would utilize for decision-making purposes. So one of the examples that we can see is, say, a university transcript database. So it can contain information about students, the classes they take, the grades that they receive, Likewise, there are many other examples that we can take. We can take like of a banking system. So that again would be collecting the user data. Then the transaction details of that user. Then who has done the transaction? It could be an automated way. It could be maybe through a teller, etc. So all these things can also be another database. So when we take this example, so one bank, all banks together would not use the same database. Likewise, a university may not use the same database for storing different information, such as financial information may be split into a different database. Likewise, within the same bank, maybe you can have, say, a loan running with the bank. So that maybe could be stored onto a different database, but linked to your ID. So that is how the information is related with each other. One of the examples of a relational database is Microsoft Access, where we see data is organized into one or more tables. So this is the most basic database that we can get. It is available on our desktop machines. We can have Microsoft Access databases easily created and used. There are definitely advantages and drawbacks of using Microsoft Access. 
but that is also a form of database. It's more of a single user database. So it's not a multi-user database. It's mostly used for few number of people rather than a huge number of people. So in databases, mainly your data is stored into tables. So they are a collection of fields. A record is an instance in the table. So a simple example of a user database, especially in a university, what is the user doing? What is this, what is the user's name? Then his major and the date of birth. So the fields co contribute to the table. That is the top part of it. And you have the records that are the actual data of the user. So whenever we speak about databases, the first crucial step that comes is designing the database. So you need to, first of all, identify how the database will be used, then identify the data that would be stored into it. So that will accomplish the goal of saving the data into the database. The next very important thing is to identify how the data is related to each other. Then identify the tables and the fields to organize the data. So whenever we speak about relating the data, we always need to have a common field between two data items through which they can be linked. For example, again, if you see the university example, so the user information would be the primary field to link the grades and the financial aspect of it together. So the grades and the finances would be linked to the user data. Likewise, another term that comes into the database is to eliminate duplicated rows to eliminate duplicate data. So that is known as normalization. So when we store data into a database, we would want to not store duplicated data. So this will also improve the performance of a database. Then we need to define what type of data would go into each of the fields? The fields could be a text field, number, boolean. Many type of fields are available. Nowadays, we also have a field as object where we can put pictures, music, videos into a particular database. So those as well are supported uh, these days in databases. And when we define the field, we define the data type that will be used. So that field will only accept that type of data. So this helps in better indexing and performance of a particular database. And not only that, your data type also indicates the amount of storage that will be occupied by that particular field. Hence, the designing part becomes very crucial. Depending on how you design the database, your database will grow and hence consume the amount of space on a particular storage. Once you have the data into your database, the next part would come for you to extract reports, that is to extract your knowledge from the database. The every instance of collecting data would lead to you utilizing the data for specific purposes. For example, again in the university example, when you enter a grade of 
a student depending upon that the next path the student can take could be decided hence having all the information with regards to the grade or to the courses the student has done helps the supervisor or the teacher to decide what next course and at what level that the student needs to take that course so just storing of data is not enough in a database we also need an efficient way to extract that data from a database so this is where you have your structured query language sql that is most commonly used to extract data from rdbms that is from relational databases now we will so far we have just discussed about relational databases but there are other type of databases also available in these days so we have the hierarchical database document centric databases so this is a place where we will generally store more of documents new type of databases that have surfaced past couple of years that's no sql databases where we do not have data in any particular structure and it does not use a sql statement to extract data from that so you have these type of data sent uh, of databases also available now what is a database management system a database management system is an application that allows data to be entered modified and deleted read and also reported it has to have a user friendly interface to design the database one of the examples we already discussed was microsoft access that runs on a user machine however is limited to one user at a time or maybe couple of users but not multi user and then we have enterprise databases enterprise databases there are many big names in the market you have oracle ms sql mysql mariadb postgresql many other databases as well available in the market which can be used as enterprise databases this these can cater to multiple request multiple users at a given time and they do have an engine that efficiently manages these loads and also can go into tbs of data whereas access is limited to couple of 100 of mbs or maybe couple of gbs but definitely does not go into tbs so access is just your desktop database which is very limited and is a good starting point for learning however not very much effective when it comes to an enterprise scale enterprise scale you would generally go on to an enterprise database that is more efficient in handling large volume of data so we are discussing now huge volumes of data now what do you describe as a huge volume when it comes to couple of years back even you could say hundreds of gbs was considered a huge volume of data you will not say couple of years maybe a many many years back however nowadays tbs of data and maybe even beyond is available and is processed so how these databases are processed so then comes in the next concept of a data warehouse a data warehouse concept came again a very long time back so when the computers were not very strong and required to process huge amount of data the data is generally denormalized and stored 
into a data warehouse. A data warehouse size is generally much, much higher than an active database where commonly read writes are taking place. Also, a data warehouse is mostly a read only database where you may have updates to them at a frequency. They are not continuously updated. They are frequently updated at batches. Batches could be determined by the business case. However, they are not frequently updated by an end user or by any application. They are mostly used for analysis. The, this will be a copy of the main production database or the database that has been consumed. So say, for example, a university database again, you would have all the current active students in your active database. Once they have passed out of the university, the entire student data could be moved onto a data warehouse where the data would not be modified. However, it would be accessible. Say a student requires a report or a verification comes for the student report for the courses that the student has done from where the data would be extracted and shared for the compliance or for the verification. It would be taken from the data warehouse and shared with the student rather than taking from the active database. What benefit does this give? First of all, the data is standardized and would have all historical data. Now, since the data has moved out from the active students database, what happens is your performance of your active student database increases as it does not need to process the old or you can say stale data that would not be getting modified anytime. So that increases the performance of your database. Does it also save your storage space? So again, that leads to cost efficiency. Yes, then the question would come, your data warehouse would anyways take the space. Yes, it will. But that could be maybe in a cheaper location and maybe having much lesser resources compared to what you're using on your live system. Or it could also be offline, depending upon the compliance requirements and how the database is structured and the data being stored on it. The data can also be stored offline, thus leading to more cost saving. So here are the few of the benefits that we already discussed. So when we actually discuss warehouse, so it also helps us better understand the data. So when you have a particular structure in your live database, you could change the structure and put it in a more relevant structure that is useful for the reporting. So when you have in your live database, you may store your courses, your fee structure, etc., in separate databases. But when it moves into your warehouse, you do not need to know whether how much fees is paid. You just need to know that the fees is paid and completely closed. So you would just maybe have a Boolean field that says, fees paid, yes, no. So again, that saves storing the entire information of the fee structure. So this is just an example. So you don't need to have the entire data stored and just say that, yes, everything, all dues cleared and the person has graduated from the university. So that organize the data better. Then you have the centralized view of data to identify inconsistent data. The inconsistencies can then be resolved that lead to higher quality of data. So that again leads to make better decisions. Data can be analyzed over multiple time periods. And there are several tools now available that can help get more better insight into the data that is already existing. 
So again, coming back to the example of the student database. So one of the analysis that can be done on an historical data is to see which courses are more undertaken by students. The students, they prefer which courses more. Then accordingly, the administrator of the school or the principal can add more capacity for that course or introduce more similar next level courses for that particular course. So that could be one of the examples depending upon the data, the insights that can be derived from the data that is stored in a data warehouse. Now again, data warehouse would be not as fast as your live database. These are mostly, mostly used to run reports and the reports again would not be live. Reports could be scheduled. They could be sent on an email or maybe could be seen onto a dashboard. And the data may not be current depending upon your refresh cycle. That is your refresh from your primary database. And also when your batch or your report executes to fresh to refresh the data on the dashboards or reports that have been created. So that is one of the drawbacks when you're coming to a data warehouse that the data may not be live. Now coming back again to the university example, when a student has exited your the university, so you would and all his close all his courses have completed. So in terms of the university, the data is completely closed. That is, the student has no further activities that would come within the university. Hence, it is safe to move that data into a data warehouse. You would not see any modifications going on to that data. It is not a hard and fast rule that the data would completely not be modified. So you do have cases where say that same student comes back again to the university for a particular course. And then again, the data would be updated against that student. Yes, that can be done. However, so this would be a delta in the change. So the data can be refreshed. The data can be updated, can be deleted as well from a data warehouse. But those circumstances are fewer compared to the static data that would be in the database. So we did discuss this part that of data warehouse. So the part of making more sense of the data or pulling out more optimized reports, you can say, or you can say making of, you can analyze the data more better. So this part is known as data mining. So one of the thumb rule when it comes to DevOps for capturing any data is to collect all possible measurable data. It could be insignificant at the current time. However, going in the future, maybe that data could bring in value at the hand of a data scientist. That's why whenever we speak about data, especially in the DevOps world, it is generally we recommend to collect all measurable parameters as much as possible. Now, when you say collect all data and store, we need to remember that any data that is stored would add to the space consumption to storage consumption that would eventually also add to your costing. So it's a double edged sword. While it does give you the benefit of storing all data, it will definitely also increase your cost. So you need to take the call of what data that you would store, how long you would store, and if you could process it and gain some sort of insights into it and then store that insights rather than storing the entire raw data. 
So that's another way of optimizing the data that you are storing. Now, what is data mining? It's an automated process of analyzing data. So this can be used to find out previously unknown trends, patterns, and associations. This will again lead to make better decisions. Data mining generally th starts with a hypothetical result in mind. So you do not go with a defined goal. So this is more of exploring rather than having a goal in mind. So there are some privacy concerns when it comes to data mining. So data mining is not an illegal term. So you generally see uh, data mining related to hacking or you can say illegally processing of some users data but it's not that data mining generally is related to processing of available data to get known unknown trends patterns or associations now the question would come that why will i get new trends patterns or associations on data the data has always been there with me but as the data grows, the data would change. Hence, the trends in the data would change and hence the pattern and associations. Now, same example we can take in a university. So if you would see the pre-2000 area uh, era in the university, as, uh, so we will take from the engineering field to make it more specific. Pre-2000 area, you would not see many people going for computers. Computers was not a very well-known field. It was coming up, no doubt about that. Especially software and hardware, I think so, are not that well-known. However, if you come after 2000, say 2000, more specifically after 2010, the computer boom came through. And you see more people getting inclined to work computer courses rather than the other fields. So this could be one example where you see how the trend has shifted from where people were mostly studying, say, a mecha mechanical course and electrical course. Now they are more focused on doing computers, more specifically on the software field. So that is one of the examples that you can see how Trends and patterns have changed over time. So this also gives us the ability of gathering business intelligence. So we can collect and analyze information to increase the competitive advantage. So where colleges would say run one class for a particular course, they see a rise in demand for the particular course. They could add more classes to it depending upon the trend that it is seeing. And it also provides analytics. So we can see how to improve the processes and practices by looking at the data as well. Now, again, this completely depends on the data that is being collected. And hence, the emphasis on collecting all data that can be measured because today we may not see the pattern, today we may not see the value in that particular data that is being collected. However, tomorrow it may help identify a trend or a pattern that could help gain an advantage. So once you have the data, you are extracting the data, you now come to the next stage that's of knowledge management. So this is the place where companies and individuals accumulate the knowledge. Now, this is not part of your database. This is something that you're extracting from the databases. You're extracting from the data that you have stored. It may not be consistently written down or saved. So another challenge is that it, even if it's recorded, it may not be consistently organized. So this is what your knowledge management will do. It will define the process of formalizing, then capturing, indexing, and storing of the knowledge. 
sharing of knowledge in an organization especially as it grows is important so that people do not do an activity repeatedly if someone has already done the activity that knowledge is present you can reutilize that knowledge so this comes at the same concept of reinventing the wheel if the wheel is already invented rather just make use of it than going to figure out a solution to do that activity so when there is already the knowledge available to do a particular activity it's better to make use of it yes definitely you can improve upon it however it is recommended you use that knowledge and build on it now how do people know whether that activity is already done that knowledge is already present that's your knowledge management's responsibility they need it needs it's another database that organizes all the knowledge at a centralized location and users can consume that knowledge so what we have seen today so we have discussed the differences between data information and technology we have defined the term database we identified the steps on how we can create it we have described the role of a database management system we also described the characteristics of a data warehouse and finally we discussed a bit on data mining and described its role in an organization okay so now we will be actually having a more open discussion because now though we were discussing databases so one thing you would have noticed so one question that should have come out i did not take anything such as a ddl statement or dml statement so that is the first thing whenever we speak about databases we generally go into databases we learn how to create tables how to insert tab how to insert a row into a database so i have not taken that approach so this should be a good question to ask why not because database systems have changed a lot how people look at databases have changed and the roles when it comes to a database within devops as well is not limited to just creating databases it also is to extract the data that is the reporting part of it then getting out patterns and trends from your data so that would mostly come into your ml and ai so this is something that comes at the level of data lake and where your data scientists would work on so another part of data mining this again is over your databases another thing that we did not cover was your distributed database systems nowadays that we see so you could call it your hadoop the big data systems that's another big uh, data warehouse collection so by term may be wrong but yes so it's still a big collection of data and the concept of using these databases have changed so when we used to speak about relational database systems like you say uh, ms sql server and oracle server then your postgresql server or mysql mariadb server these servers are relational databases and they make use of your structured query language sql to read update modify data whereas and sorry and this also means that they expect and we expect whenever we execute a query against the particular database against a particular table or a row that the data would be consistent every time we execute a query we will get the same output provided the data has not been manipulated so the consistency is the backbone for a relational database for a database management system however trends are changing when we speak about hadoop that is big data 
it is built on the foundation expecting that the database storage system that is your actual machines that are storing the database will fail so yes this changes your total concept of how you're looking at database where you see for reliability before now when you come to a hadoop system a big data system though it stores a huge amount of data we are expecting that the nodes within the database would fail hence you build around it you have countermeasures in place so that you can get reliable data extracted from them so these are again very huge concepts not going into depth of them as i just kept it as an open discussion you just need to know that yes these are available you are interested to go into the depths of that there are several courses available maybe we could arrange in-depth courses here as well but wanted to broaden your view of databases likewise you can also see the example of blockchain so that also is again a type of a database where you store data it is similar to hadoop again it goes on a concept assuming that it does not trust any of the hosts or you can say your so uh, your cryptocurrency also bit uh, blockchain also is a distributed database system it starts with the concept that says that i do not trust what data that you give me so though all the data is shared by the various servers within its cluster it does not trust it it will vote on what is a, the correct value or what should be the correct data in that uh, and based on that it will determine the data that is being stored in it so these are concepts that i'm discussing so the concepts keep on changing the way it is actually implemented would be different depending on the platform that you are seeing at that's why you see many countries are objecting towards these currencies but yes some of them have adopted them they are pros they are cons as well before we adopt a database system we need to identify what are the pros what are the cons and how it will benefit the particular assignment or task and then take the decision to go ahead with it so likewise there are many examples like this that we can see another example i would give is uh, when you go to relational databases, so once again, now we have several options to use a relational database. A relational database could be maybe on-premises that is completely managed by an organization. And thus you need to, so when you say on-premises, so it will also determine on whether you want to use an open source database or you want to use a paid version of a database when you say open source you have several enterprise grade databases such as mariadb you have postgresql they are totally free for use when it comes to enterprise grade paid ones you have ms sql leading you have oracle as a equal competitor then you do have mysql it's though it's open source so but it's still a paid edition free for community but it's a paid edition for enterprises so you need to identify how much data you're going to store the type of support you would require open source databases would generally be a bit back on support wise so when you're mostly going with enterprise databases, depending upon your enterprise and the expertise that you have within the organization, it needs to be decided on what type of database would be procured and what type of database would be utilized. Yes, definitely the costing of purchasing the database would come into picture, the support costs for it. So even support has additional costs for it. So that would come into picture hosting charges that again would be a factor that you would see into 
purchasing a database. So then comes the next concept that is of your security as well. So since you're hosting it within your environment, then definitely security will be an other concern. And then would come another concept of whether you should host it or use a shared space. When you say a shared space, so I'm looking at more uh, of a platform as a service that is say an RDS in Amazon or an Azure database when it comes to uh, the Azure cloud where you are not owning the entire database engine. However, you will just own a database and all the security patching upgrades whatever need to be done is taken care by the vendor including the mirroring and high availability of the database yes so that's another thing that you need to consider whenever you are working <coughs> excuse me on our database management system you need to have it highly available it needs to be consistent it needs to be accessible whenever required to ensure all these things yes definitely there's a cost associated with it let it be an open source database or let it be a paid version of database there's a cost associated with hosting them for making them highly available also the speed of transactions again add cost to it so your networking layer again needs to be quite strong so that it could share the data as well as you need to have good hardware that could support high and long running queries onto a particular database. Now, when it comes to the cloud, again, you have several options. You have distributed databases such as uh, on amazon itself you have distributed databases i think so it's cosmo db is on azure and on amazon you have it's uh i don't remember the name so the distributed databases is the same term like we discussed hadoop so your distributed database is spread across the globe. You can access it from anywhere. And it does give you that feature, like just like we discussed for the Hadoop. So your database is distributed across the globe and it gives you the consistency from crashes. So in case it is crashed, it does not, you do not lose the data. Also the consistency has different model of management. Okay, uh, so AWS has Amazon Aurora. So that's one of the databases that is distributed on AWS. So when you say distributed, so generally the question would come that, wow, if a database can give me such type of uptime, so it would be more better for me to go with a distributed database. The answer would generally be no. It depends upon your use case. What are you using the database for? where and when you say it's a distributed it does not mean that your data will be on real time spread across all the databases in the entire world when you say distributed is that it will update it will be available across the node but yes the more you write onto it the slower the replication will go more the chances of consistency issues whereas these type of data bases are more efficient for reads where you need to mostly read data from a particular database at different locations a cosmo db or a distributed database would be more efficient whereas where you're looking for fast read and writes more consistency you would mostly go with 
a highly available database system and RDMS, which will be hosted in a single data center. So yes, though there are benefits, you have cons as well. So depending upon that, you need to make a decision on the database system that you would take. Now going another step further, we do see the internet boom. We have heard of the term IoT, Internet of Things, where you have n number of devices, almost you can say infinite, infinite number of devices that are nowadays available, and they send a huge amount of data to their sources. How are these devices, how are the DBMS coping up to handle this type of data. So that is an other thing that should come to your mind. So they are databases that can handle such huge type of data. So again, I will say from the Azure side, there are IoT hubs available, which capture such type of data. So are these DBMS? Yes, these are also type of databases that capture this huge amount of incoming data. These data may be consistent, may be inconsistent. Remember, they may not have a particular, you can say, type of fields that they would send. Even the fields that they would send, they may not have consistent data. Some may send text, some may say and send numbers. The numbers may again not be consistent. Some may be in decimals, some may be in whole numbers. So the data may not be consistent, may be consistent, could be from different devices, tending different measurements. For example, you can say they could be a device that measures the pressure, that is your barometer at a particular place. Whereas you may have another device that is just measuring the temperature at a given place. So your data is not consistent that is being shared. You do have an IoT hub that collects the data. Then you would have an automated process that would pick up this data, read the data, make sense of it, and then maybe store it into a distributed database system or into a relational database system that could be further used to process and make a use for data mining and make sense out of the data. So there are a lot of things when that is coming nowadays into the database system. So it's not for you to limit yourself to the simple SQL commands. There is a lot of things going on in databases. And yes, uh, most of the people are also aware of Google's AI, where you can click a picture and Google can go ahead and break that picture down and show you similar pictures to a given picture search. So this is more I'm speaking about is your picture search. That is again more on your AI and how it does that. It's again a database after all in the backend that it is utilizing to break down your picture and search for pictures similar to that. Likewise, the applications that you use, such as Facebook, Instagram, you get the face tagging and all. So that, again, is a type of database, again, mixed with your AI, that is your artificial intelligence, that uses various engines to identify matching pictures and say, yes, this person matches this particular person. So yes, so these two pictures are of the same person. So it does use your help. So AI is again a very huge topic, which can go into huge discussions. But yes, again, your databases do found as do come as a foundation for AI. You do need data before your AI engine can analyze it to bring out trends and make sense and identify business trends or give you predictions based on the data that you have captured. When it comes to AI, you require a huge amount of data to process. So they are specific AI languages that are available. So we have discussed SQL Server. Then you have the 
a Kibana language, uh, which is used for your AI processing. So they are separate languages that do come into that. Okay, so this is all I had for discussing about databases and data more specifically. Any questions so far? Sorry, I think so. The session was very overwhelming, but yes, there was a lot to cover. And yes, databases, like the other topics, like networking and all, is a huge topic. A lot of options available these days. I just wanted to give you an overview of what all things are going on currently in the industry. So you're not limited to the scope of just an MS SQL server or just a SQL language. A lot of things going on can broaden your scope and see what appeals to you the most. Okay, I think there are no questions, so no worries. Uh, you can always reach out in the community channel for any queries that you may have. You can always ping me on chat and yes, we can have a discussion. So thank you for joining this, this session and see you in the next session. Okay, thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.